everyone. Welcome back to another episode here on The Dark Side. I'm your host, Sherry. Today's case is about a young woman from Petersburg, Virginia, only two months shy of her 24th birthday. She and her adult brother take a cruise with their parents, and their partying only lasts a few days, and suddenly the young woman is missing. Most times when a person goes missing from a cruise ship, we think of the obvious three outcomes. The person was depressed and committed suicide, or they were pushed off the ship during a crime of passion, Natalie Wood, I'm looking at you, or they got drunk and fell over the edge. But the problem with these theories is that there have been several eyewitness credible accounts of Amy being seen on the island over the years. What the heck happened here? This case was recommended to me by one of my friends. Her name is Mackenzie. So if you hear this, Mackenzie, I love you. This is episode 79, The Disappearance of Amy Bradley. This story takes place in 1998. Bill Clinton was president and Al Gore was vice president. The Unabomber Ted Kaczynski was sentenced to four life terms. He just died like a month ago. Matthew Shepard was beaten and murdered in one of the worst hate crimes ever recorded. Microsoft released Windows 98, and Apple released the iMac. The search engine Google was founded by two PhD students. And lastly, gas prices stayed between $1.17 and $1.25. Amy Lynn Bradley was born May 12, 1974. At the time of this story, she is 23 years old. She has a younger brother named Brad, who was 21, and her parents are Ron and Iva Bradley. They all live in Peterson, Virginia. I watched interviews with her parents. I just love her mom. I say that about a lot of the moms in these cases, but she seems like just a wonderful person. Growing up, Amy and her brother Brad had everything they really wanted. They were a close family, and Amy was a star athlete. She was so good at basketball that she actually played on the boys' team. She was also a really good swimmer. Amy had just graduated from college where she attended on a full scholarship for her basketball skills and she earned her degree in physical education. She just got her first apartment and was supposed to start a new job after they returned from their cruise. So she is just barely into the real world, like right at the edge of being an independent adult and being out on her own. Amy and her brother Brad and their parents are gonna go on this cruise for one week. It was like one last adventure as a family before Brad and Amy each start their own adult lives. They flew from their home in Virginia to Puerto Rico. They board the ship in San Juan. Then from there, they will take the cruise to a Caribbean island named Curacao. The ship is a Royal Caribbean cruise, and the name of the ship is the Rhapsody of the Sea. The Rhapsody of the Sea has 18 decks and is still sailing today in 2023, but back in 1998, it was almost a brand new ship. Ron worked as an insurance sales agent, and he had won this cruise as a prize through his office, but the prize only covered Ron and his wife, Iva, so they purchased two additional tickets so their two adult children could join them. Now, Amy was not crazy about this trip. Even though she's a really good swimmer and was once a lifeguard, she wasn't a big fan of bodies of water that are, you know, ocean size or big ships, and she's hesitant to attend. But her brother Brad told her about the cruise he had taken before and how wonderful of a time it was. So she's still reluctant, but she opts to go anyway because her brother convinced her she would have a good time. I almost wonder if Amy felt general anxiety like a lot of people do, or if she truly sensed something sinister would soon arrive. Amy did have a good time, but the fun in the first couple days on the ship didn't last long because Amy will eventually disappear. It's March 21st, 1998. Amy, Brad, and their parents board the ship with 2,000 other guests. This is like a big floating hotel. 
Brad and Amy share a room with their parents on deck number eight. Amy gets on and quickly realizes what all the fuss is about. There's bars, there's swimming pools, nightclubs, and fun activities, and fine dining, and all these cool amenities. She's happy she chose to go along. This trip will be one week of traveling on the cruise ship and stopping at various islands. Remember, this is international water, so no one is really in charge. There's no law enforcement on the ship. There are security guards, but these are employees of Royal Caribbean Cruises. It's so murky when you get into areas like this. It's like, whose jurisdiction is it? Amy's mother, Iva, says that while on the ship, Amy was receiving a tremendous amount of of attention from the crew members. Men kept hitting on her. One even approached her father and asked if he could take her to Carlos and Charlie's restaurant once they got to Aruba. Her dad said he would pass on the message to her. You know, the name Carlos and Charlie's immediately raised my little true crime flag in my brain. I remember that this is the same place that was Natalie Holloway's last sighting before she got in a car with three men back in 2005 and disappeared. Anyway, Amy is not feeling it, and she thinks that they're just creepy. She's not entertaining any of these guys who are flirting with her. She's here with her family and just wants to enjoy the trip with them. Amy picked up a postcard for her friend back home and that she had mailed. It read, Hey girl, it's gorgeous here. We leave for Aruba tomorrow. Take care. I'll be home Saturday at 10 o'clock. See ya. The first day the ship travels to Aruba, Amy and her family spent the next day exploring shops, playing water sports, and eating out. On March 23rd, the ship departed Aruba and was en route to its next island port of Curacao. The second night of the trip, Amy and her family are going to do this fine dining experience. The men wear these nice suits and Amy and her mom wore beautiful dresses. The ship's photographer snapped a photo of Amy and her brother Brad, and this is one of the most widely publicized photos of Amy since it was her last photo before she disappeared. After dinner, Amy and her brother Brad headed to one of the ship's nightclubs to dance. Their parents came along too, but left at 1.30 a.m. to head back to the room for bed. Amy and her brother, being 21 and 23, they want to keep on partying. Brad ran into some girls and is pretty distracted. They're dancing to the cruise's house band, which is a band called Blue Orchid. Amy danced with the bass player, a man named Alistair Douglas, but his nickname is Yellow. According to the disappearedblog.com, Amy and her brother partied hard until the wee hours of the morning. The ship's computerized door lock systems showed that Brad returned to their suite at 3.35 a.m., while Amy arrived five minutes later. Brad and Amy sat on the balcony and talked for a bit. It's like 4 o'clock in the morning at this point. I remember being 23 and able to hang out until 4 in the morning. Now I'd be passed out at 11 o'clock. Brad decides he's going to head into bed and left Amy sitting on the balcony. They told each other that they loved they loved one another, and then Brad says that was the last time he ever saw his sister Amy. Between 5.15 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., this is around an hour after Brad went to bed, Amy's dad, Ron, woke up from his bed, and he could see their private balcony. He saw Amy sleeping in a lounge chair. He feels relief knowing both kids are back in the room, and then he closes his eyes and drifts back to sleep for a bit. He woke up 45 minutes later. This is 6 a.m. now. He doesn't see Amy in her bed, but he sees Brad in his. He goes on the balcony where he had saw her less than an hour before, but now she's nowhere to be found. Her cigarettes and lighter were missing, but that's it. What happened to Amy in that 45-minute window between when her dad saw her in the balcony and when he woke up the second time? Everything else of Amy's was still in the room. Her ID, all her clothes, and the nine pairs of shoes that she brought on the trip. So wherever Amy is, she doesn't have shoes. At the same time, two passengers claim they saw her riding the elevator to the top deck on the ship carrying her room key, cigarettes, and a lighter. This is completely out of character for her. She's close with her family. She's not going to take off and not tell them where she's going unless she only planned to be gone for a few minutes. The problem here is that the ship is getting ready to dock at Curacao. They have a small window of time to try to locate Amy before 2,000 passengers get off the ship. Ron wakes his wife and son up and says Amy is missing. Her parents report to the ship's employees that their daughter is missing. They ask them to make an announcement and please not let everyone off the boat. 
But the crew declined, saying it was too early to make an announcement like that, and they typically reserve these things for if it's a missing child. I get they don't want to alarm everyone trying to enjoy their trip, but honestly, they should have just made the announcement that a passenger couldn't be located and gave a description of her. If I'm on a cruise with my family and I hear an announcement like that, I'm certainly not going to go, oh, geez, our vacation's ruined. I'm going to help look for her. I think most of you would, too. So they're not even going to start the search until everyone is off the boat. The staff is busy getting ready to dock at Curacao, so they're preoccupied with that and not this missing 23-year-old. Her family is in a full-blown panic at this point. This is bad because once the ship docks, a kidnapper could carry her off and onto the land. It wasn't until 7.50 a.m. when the majority of passengers had already exited off the ship that an announcement was made asking for Amy to report to the front desk. Not a loud alarm stating there's a missing passenger, just a, will Amy Bradley please meet your party at the front message over the loudspeaker. The crew searches the boat for her, but she's nowhere to be found. We later learned that this search was only the common areas and the bathroom. No passenger rooms or employee rooms were looked at. The ship's captain tells them that Amy is not on the boat. Obviously, the first question is, did Amy somehow climb over the rail and fall overboard? The waters were searched and there was no sign of her. But the thing is, Amy was reluctant about even going near the railing. Her dad and brother had to stand next to her and hold on to her because she was so nervous. She had gone near the railing once with her dad and brother, looks out, says, yes, it's beautiful, now get me away from here. As well, Amy was a strong swimmer. Remember, she's very athletic and had a degree in physical education. Even if she was thrown off the boat by someone, she likely would have survived. Most importantly, the boat was very close to the shoreline. She would have been located almost instantly. Her family and police have ruled out the theory of Amy going overboard. The crew eventually goes back and searches every room and no signs of Amy. Iva says during this time she had no feeling in her arms. Her husband Ron was vomiting and their son Brad was curled up in a fetal position crying. It's unimaginable what they're going through, knowing Amy was just here and now no one can find her. When it comes to these missing persons cases, time is everything. The more time that passes, the more grim the situation is. In Amy's case, it's a matter of minutes. They need to get Amy's photo out there, but the problem is that it's 1998 and there's no camera phone mom can whip out and show a picture. But they remembered that a cruise ship photographer had taken their picture, a bunch of them, just the evening before. Basically, on these fine dining nights, a professional photographer is there, and he will take these nice formal photos of your family. You can come out and view the photos and pick which ones you want to purchase. But mysteriously, all of the photos of Amy were gone. The photographer says he knows he took those pictures of Amy, he remembered her, and he remembered printing them, but all the pics of her on the display wall were missing. Ron, Iva, and Brad get off the boat and start searching the island. They are convinced someone snuck her off the boat and now has her. They head to the U.S. Embassy hoping they will get some kind of help from them and that they will be taken seriously. The boat is eventually ready to leave Curacao and head to the island of St. Martin. There are still 2,000 other guests who paid for their trip, so the boat has to continue on. The Bradley family decided that they needed to stay in Curacao while they waited for the Coast Guard and the FBI to show up. The FBI arrived pretty quickly, and they conducted their own search on the island. The CEO of the insurance company that Ron works for flew himself down to the Curacao to assist with the search. After all, it was his company that had given Ron tickets for the cruise. He chartered a private jet to take Ron and Iva to St. Martin, which is the cruise's next stop. Once they are there and the cruise ship is there, Ron and Iva walk on the ship and say they want to speak to the captain. They tell him the FBI is now involved and would be entering the boat shortly. But the ship's lawyer tells them that U.S. authorities had no jurisdiction on board the ship as it was registered in the Bahamas and they were currently in international waters. I swear this makes me never want to go on a cruise. The FBI and the cruise ship finally reach an agreement. Two FBI agents are allowed to conduct an investigation on the ship. However, they must be in plain clothes and they cannot alarm any of the other guests. 
the FBI didn't end up finding much evidence. There were a few people interviewed. Two girls said they saw Amy early in the morning talking to the bass player from the house band I told you about earlier. His name is Alistair Douglas, also known as Yellow. But most disturbing was they said they saw him hand her a drink. Yellow was interviewed and said he had been hanging out with Amy, but she blew him off after a while. Amy's brother Brad said he saw them dancing together the night before, and Amy was trying to get away from him after a bit. Yellow sees thousands of women, he says, come and go on these cruises, so it wasn't a big deal to him that she blew him off. There was a person there who was making a professional video for the cruise ship that showcased their entertainment, and in the video, it caught Yellow and Amy dancing together, not close at all, but a few feet apart. The FBI gave Yellow a polygraph, and he passed. I know I said the drink was the most disturbing part of this, but there's something else about him. The morning that Amy went missing, her family is looking for her. This is the very early stages. Yellow saw Brad on the ship while they were searching. He says to him, I'm sorry about your sister. Brad didn't realize it until days later when it dawned on him. No one but the family knew at that time that Amy was missing. They hadn't alerted the staff yet. They were just running around trying to locate her. How in the world did they did he know anything about Amy being missing? The FBI eliminated Yellow as a suspect, but he seems like a very likely candidate. The boat leaves St. Martin. It traveled to the Virgin Islands and finally back to Puerto Rico on March 28th. Everyone that was on that ship has now gone back to their lives, except the Bradley family. They have to come home without one of their children. Amy's family has this theory that Amy had been drugged and then taken off the ship to be sold into a sex trafficking ring. Pretty women vacationing on the islands have been captured and sold to sex traffickers. It happens. Once taken, they are very hard to get back. Sometimes they end up dead. Look at the movie Taken. Remember what Liam Neeson had to go through in order to get his daughter back. Once Amy's family returns back to Virginia, they set up this ground zero area at their home. This is a makeshift command center. They're hanging huge maps and going over every single thing that happened on that cruise prior to Amy disappearing. They set up a hotline where people can call in tips. Amy's mother spent most of the day on the phone and waiting next to the phone for any info or some kind of a ransom call. Just a few months later, they returned to Curacao to look for her. A taxi driver in Curacao went to police because he said a woman who matched exactly to that missing lady from the cruise ship approached his cab and asked for a phone. When he told her he didn't have one, she quickly ran away. Another saw her with two men who were guiding her as she was walking and obviously in charge of her. There's been thousands of tips that have come in regarding Amy over the last 25 years. One of the best leads in this entire case came from a man named David Carmichael, who was from Canada, but he was vacationing in Curacao with his friend Brian. This is August of 1998, just five months after Amy disappeared. He saw an episode of Unsolved Mysteries in May of 1999 where they talked about Amy, so he called in the tip because he remembered last August he and his friend Brian were walking on the beach and saw a woman resembling Amy. She had two large men on either side of her. She looked like she wanted to come over and talk to them, but the men had a firm grip on her and wouldn't allow her to. He says the woman had a tattoo of some kind of lizard on her stomach and a tattoo of a Tasmanian devil on her shoulder. Well, Amy had a gecko tattoo on her stomach and on her shoulder there was a Tasmanian devil spinning a basketball. David says he is 100% certain the woman who walked past him was Amy. Another credible lead would come later when a man says that in 1999, he was part of the Navy and while stationed in Curacao, he attended a brothel. This is one year after Amy disappeared. He says while at the brothel, a Caucasian woman came up to him and said her name is Amy and she's from Virginia. She says, you have to help me. I'm not allowed to leave. He tells her that his ship is right down the road. If she needs help, just go to it. He is nervous because he doesn't want to be caught at this brothel, 
It could get he could get in trouble with the Navy or his family back home. That's the reason it took him three years to report it. He saw her picture on the cover of People magazine and knew right away that she was the same woman he saw in the brothel. By the time the man had contacted her family, remember, it's been three years since he was at that brothel. Any hope the family had was quickly dashed when they flew to Curacao to go to this brothel and they see it's no longer there because it had burned down. In the fall of 1999, Amy's mother, Iva, is sitting at home. She still runs this command center out of her living room. Well, she receives an email that she thinks will change everything. This will bring her daughter home after more than a year of being missing. She gets an email from a man named Frank Jones. Frank is a former U.S. Army Special Forces officer, and he specializes in rescuing those who have been captured. He has a team of men who consist of former ex-Army Rangers and Navy SEALs willing to help. He negotiates and he gets him released. That's what he does. He tells Iva and Ron he may be able to rescue Amy. If he has to, he'll put her on his back and swim her home himself. At this point, the family knows they aren't getting any help from the officials in Curacao. The FBI can't do any more, saying, We've pursued every angle from whether there was foul play, a suicide, or an accident, and we've basically gotten nowhere. So they see this as their best way to finally get Amy back. What have they got to lose? Yes, please, go get her off that fucking island. Frank Jones sends two of his men down there to do some looking around and reports back to the family that there's a couple leads here. They say that Amy was spotted around a grocery store shopping and other air and running other errands, but she was always accompanied by a man with long blonde hair. A local woman even gave an accurate description of Amy's tattoos. Frank has some of his men set up surveillance at a couple of these locations. They report back that Amy was spotted in an SUV with a man with long blonde hair. Frank says in his report that Amy was in a dangerous situation and under guard and that his men were forced to leave after a week on the island when they were fired at by over 10 men. Over the next few months, he sends more reports of rumors about Amy. Basically, she is always in imminent danger and extremely hard to get to. You'll be killed if you if you go near her or Amy will be killed, so they have to plan her rescue very carefully. He says Amy was being held in a barbed wire complex protected by hev- heavily armed guards. He tells them finally it's time for the rescue, but he's going to need more money to pull this off. They say, okay, no problem, but first we want a picture. This is called proof of life. We need to know that Amy is 100% alive before we fork over more money. His remote guys send them a photo of what appears to be Amy on the beach. The woman was wearing a sun hat and she had a tattoo. And even though the picture was taken from a distance, you could tell this is Amy's tattoo. And it does look just like her. She was with a man with long blonde hair. Iva said she felt a lot of relief seeing this photo, but first they have to give Frank $211,000. So they had $24,000 of their own money, and then they raised the additional funds pretty quickly. They give Frank his $211,000, and he and his men are off to the island of Curacao. The Bradleys fly to Florida to wait at a hotel, as Frank had instructed them to do, There, they have a private jet waiting on standby provided by Ron's company. I swear this guy has like the best employer ever. (laughs) The private jet is there for when they get Amy, they can bring her back to Virginia. Iva and Ron are scheduling doctor's visits for her and everyone is very excited and waiting on standby for the call that Amy is free. Iva has the phone within inches of her hand. Each day passes in that hotel room and the phone never rang. She never left the room for one week except two times to go to the front desk and the parking lot. After being in the hotel for a week, the family decides to go back home. Back in Curacao, one of Frank's men, whose name is Tim, and he's a former Army Special Forces sniper, he's wondering about what Frank is telling this family. He had been paid by Frank to do surveillance of this house where Amy was supposedly being held, But all he could see was that it was just some ordinary family living there. He doesn't see armed guards and barbed wire. He sees no signs of Amy. 
He and Frank were at a bar, and Frank was on the phone with Ron and Iva, telling them the house was being watched at this very moment. Tim's like, but I'm right here at a bar with you. What are you talking about? Tim feels Frank is lying to her parents and decides to call them himself. He tells them Frank never served in the special forces and made all that up. Yeah, we're down here doing surveillance, but we don't have any signs of her anywhere. They say, well, what about the photo that was sent to us, sent to us of the girl on the beach? He tells them that he learned Frank had paid a man to wear a blonde wig and pose next to a girl who looked like Amy, and they took the picture from a distance. They even put temporary tattoos on her. The beach where this photo was taken was Pensacola, Florida. It wasn't even the island of Curacao. All the stories of Amy being seen in the grocery store, accompanied by a man with long blonde hair, Amy being seen in a green SUV, they were all false. The family is devastated. And it's not even about the money. They wasted so much time with Frank. That's the issue. I told you earlier, time is the most important piece here. So Frank Jones is a liar and a piece of shit who preyed on these vulnerable parents who were at their wits end. I don't blame them one bit. They trusted him and believed his info to be credible. This is not the first time this has happened to parents of a missing child. I truly hope there's a place in hell reserved just for people who do this. In April of 2002, Frank was sentenced to five years in prison. In 2005, the family gets another clue, likely the most popular one involved in this case. Iva gets some photos emailed to her. They are taken from an adult escort website advertising sex workers in the islands. One of the girl's names is Jazz. The photos strike an uncanny resemblance to Amy. She looks older, more weathered. She looks like she's been through some shit. But there are some very similar characteristics. She looks exactly what you would think Amy looked like if she had aged several years. Her hair was still brown, but longer. She's posing in these sexy positions wearing lingerie. According to amybradleyismissing.com, quote, a complete forensic evaluation was done to determine if the photographs were Amy Bradley. The forensic evaluation was done by Wesley Neville, a well-known and highly respected certified forensic artist at International Association for Identification in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Wesley Neville is recognized as a leader in forensic identification, and he is a former law enforcement officer from South Carolina. Wesley Neville maintains that the photographs from the Affordable Adult Vacations website are Amy Bradley. I don't know if the family would have tried to schedule an appointment with Jazz, maybe have someone pose as a customer and want to meet this Jazz, but the woman in the photos was never identified and has never come forward, but this 100% looks like Amy. Amy's mother said in 2005, Our lives have been so drastically changed in the last seven years. Every waking moment is, where is Amy? I just want people to know that when girls disappear outside of the country, they're disappearing for a reason. And slavery and sex trafficking is so alive and well, it would be ab- it would absolutely blow you away. We believe with every fiber in our being that someone took her and we want her back. I have tried to make deals with God. If you find her today, you can take me tomorrow. When they say the worst nightmare, it is. It's the worst nightmare. Amy's brother Brad finds a small shred of comfort that the last words he said to his sister that morning out on the balcony after their night of partying were, I love you. Amy's family believe that she left the cabin and was kidnapped somewhere on the ship. Witnesses have testified for a federal grand jury that Amy was seen on the upper deck with Alistair Douglas, a.k.a. Yellow, between 5.30 and 5.45 a.m., This was the short time when her dad had woken up, seen her, and then fell back asleep. This was a window of opportunity for Amy to be kidnapped. Amy was declared legally dead in 2010. There there isn't a lot of chatter about her case these days because there hasn't been any more sightings or any clues. But Iva, Ron, and Brad still hold out hope that Amy is alive. Remember the Canadian man who spotted an exact match to Amy on the beach accompanied by two men? They believe him. He was not affiliated with Frank Jones. They have even met with him multiple times. They believe Amy is being held as a sex slave all these years. 
If Amy is alive, I wonder how often she thinks back to her her old life, probably every hour. She was a star athlete, a great student. She had just adopted a dog and was ready to start her a new a new job and she had just finished college. She's been missing longer than she wasn't. I'm so sorry this happened to her. It seems like she was careful in in her every move. Remember, she was turning down men left and right, but she still ended up being taken. If you're ever on a cruise ship or on international waters or out on these islands, please be careful. Please always have somebody with you, you know, stick together. It's just so dangerous. You hear about these all the time with Natalie Holloway, Madeline McCann, you know, just please be careful. Amy, wherever you are, you are missed and you are loved. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care and much love to you all.